Hello, I'm Ron Simon, head of the curatorial department of the Paley Center for Media, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to a very special Paley at Home presented by City. Today, we are pleased to present our annual pitch competition, where five emerging filmmakers from around the country will pitch their ideas to our panel of documentary experts. Our judges will critique the concepts and reels and then select the best pitch. The grand prize winner will receive a $5,000 grant from our generous annual sponsor, a and &E Indie Films. This year, we've received so many outstanding submissions, so many worthy of making. We've selected five diverse and exemplary projects for presentation today. We're doing things a little differently this year in our virtual edition, and we've asked our filmmakers to create an eight minute verbal pitch and reel for their projects. I'm sure you'll be impressed with all the films and you'll have a chance to vote for your favorite. Look for the information about our Audience Choice Award on this YouTube page. We have five documentary professionals who I'm sure have heard many pitches over their careers and will share their wisdom about the most effective and persuasive pitch. Let's meet our judges now. First, Opal Hope Bennett. She's Shorts Producer, American Documentaries POV. Next up is Janet Gargi, Vice President, Head of Documentaries, Vice Studios. Next is Diana Holtzberg, President, East Village Entertainment. Next up is Marie Nelson, Senior Vice President, Integrated Content Strategy, ABC News. And finally, Christine Ketcher. She's Manager, Feature Films at A&E Networks, and she represents our sponsor, A&E Indie Films. So we're about to meet our filmmakers, but before we do, I just have one question. What makes the best pitch? You've heard so many over your careers. What would you recommend as the best way to present your project. Marie, do you wanna start? Sure, I mean, first of all, for me, it's gotta pique my curiosity um, and it's got to be a, essentially, a, you know, the perfect example of your film. It's gotta have a clean beginning, middle and end. Uh, and I always love when I feel like, um, you know, the writing behind the pitch is also just really strong and, and, and just drives you forward so that you're sitting on the edge of your seat by the end. And Janet, would you have anything to add? Um, following on that, I think it really needs to be a compelling story. Um, has to hook you, the characters, the description, the arc, and uh, definitely, you know, have an understanding of what that journey might be. So be very specific and clear about what your story is and who your characters are. And there's always a question, do you listen more to the verbal pitch or do you look at the real? Opal, do you have a preference? You try to get to know the filmmaker both ways. That's a really good question. Um, honestly, I think it depends on the project. There have been circumstances where I've been really uh, pulled in and intrigued by the real and then to you know Maurice and Jeanette's point, uh, once you're hearing from the filmmaker, you realize that there might be some things that they hadn't thought out, um, or they're really compelling and charismatic speakers, um, but the real reveals something different. <laughs> so you know, I think it I think it depends on the project. I, I, ideally, uh, they work hand in hand and uh, support a comprehensive presentation of the project. And when it's done, both verbal and uh, and the real, you feel like you want to go ahead and support. Diana, what do you think? Uh, you've heard so many pitches. What works for you? Well, I'll, I'll concur with what everybody has said so far. I think a great story, exclusive access, the ability to, um, to concisely say what it is in a log line and to be able to answer those three why questions. Why is this film being made? Why now and why you're making it? And also to, to add to what uh, you asked about the written material, I often find that, that the written material doesn't, or the real, they don't always, always work right in the beginning and they need some 
some assistance because it's very hard to have all of the skill sets in one person. And Christine, um, what do you look for, especially at A&E indie films? Oh, sure. I think, you know, I agree with everything everyone said already, but I tend to be very drawn towards the visual material. Um, obviously, the, the written can do a lot to support that and talk about the director's vision, but it's a unique opportunity in the doc world where we get to see a little bit of your creative vision, your artistic style, and then also who your characters are in this reel. So if you're not using that to the best effect, it's really a missed opportunity. So that's always huge for us. And of course it does depend on the the subject, you know, if your story is going to be really character driven, then I want to meet those characters as soon as possible. Well, this year we're doing something a little differently and our filmmakers are not only doing the reel, but they're doing their intro too. So let's take a look at our first project, Brief Tender Light. Hello, my name is Arthur Musa, and I'm the producer and director of a feature documentary called Brief Tender Light. When I was 19, I came to the US to attend a college called MIT. The flight that brought me to America was full of other African students who were coming to colleges all over the US. 20 years later, most of us are wondering what happened to our ambitions to go back to our countries and make a difference. Those are the questions that inspire the film I'm telling you about, Brief Tender Light. So my film follows four African students as they arrive to attend an elite American college, uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. This is an intense school. It is one of the best engineering schools in the world. And so they want to make use of that opportunity at an elite education, and they want to make it count for their home countries. But after years of living in America, can they really return home? Here's a brief teaser. comes after G. It's the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Hey! When I got the letter of acceptance, I remember it was like 3 a.m. I would never forget it. We'll be landing in 20 minutes. Our challenge is to advance knowledge and educate students in science, technology, and the areas of scholarship that will best serve the nation and the world in the 21st century. Coming here, I know it's a great institution, a great college, so I was excited because I know I'm going to be like a big asset for my country. This is our grandfather and grandmother who are actually victims of the genocide in 1994. I was one when it happened. One thing that I can notice from the genocide is the fact that people are so motivated and driven to like make this country better. He would be able to come back to teach in our universities or to work for any company or to start his own business. There are many ways he can uh, be able to improve it. Okay, if you have like a, a window open that's playing YouTube videos, torrenting NSA documents, or whatever, if you could just close those down. For me to rate the next 10 years as being successful, one of the major things that I would look on is my ability to change the story of my family. <laughs> Hi there. I'm very, very happy. I'm very, very happy to see you. Human capital is one of the key sources of sustainable competitive advantage. And sending African sons and daughters to world-class institutions is required. It was in the press that he was one of the highest people in the whole of Zimbabwe. Yeah. Life became particularly hard because President Mugabe was so much obsessed with staying in power. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's near, but I want to work with people. I want to be a politician one day. After you graduate, you can come back to Zimbabwe? Yeah. I'm coming back to the president, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Democracy, when the people's vote is allowed to represent their wishes. 
you've become too westernized. You're thinking the western way. When you're in a new environment, your body and your way of thinking, the way you are, adapts to it so much that if you don't watch out, it can swallow your life and you can forget like where you actually come from. Engineering is first, just as a population, it's not perceived by many. And then when you break it down between female and male, it's not perceived by many females also. How did you break into that? When I was little, I always liked physics, math, and chemistry. So I feel like I was always inclined on that. Okay. <laughs> we need more of you to help us with our transport system. It has changed so much. And I was like, oh my god, look at that. Oh my god. You know, I was like, Sante, really stop. Why is this so foreign to you? When you're in college, I would call it the formative time of one's life. A time whereby you're discovering who you are. I am the person to bring the country back. I am the person to contribute to change. As you may have noticed from the teaser, we have four main characters. First, we have Sante, who's a driven young woman from Tanzania, and she wants to run a civil engineering firm and be a shining example for girls. Next, we have Billy, who's from an upper middle class family in Rwanda. They have a good network. His brother got married to President Kagame's daughter last year, for example. And Billy wants to play a role in his country, Rwanda's efforts to rebuild post the genocide of 1994. Third, we have Philip, who's from northern Nigeria, and his family have struggled since losing their dad when he was 10 years old. As the oldest of five kids, he feels like it is up to him to secure the well-being of his family at all costs. And then finally, we have Fidelis, whose ultimate goal is to become president of Zimbabwe someday. And that is because he wants to be the antidote to Zimbabwe's dictator president, Robert Mugabe, who'd been in power for more than 30 years. Now, while there are four characters, their stories are unified by a common central question. And that is, can youthful idealism, this brief tender light of the film's title, can that youthful idealism survive the process of growing up? Um, there are one million internationals who come to the U.S. to study every year. 40,000 of those come from Africa. And these young people believe that they can do anything. That idealism can be a powerful force for nation building. And yet, it can also be a fragile force, subject to the geopolitical forces at play in our world. And that is what my film explores. Um, we have completed production. We run production from 2011 through 2019. We have a full rough cut available and I am currently looking for funding for the remainder of the edit and for finishing costs. So thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions. Let's meet the filmmaker of Brief Tender Light, Arthur Musa. Now, uh, Marie, would you like to talk just a little bit about breathe tender light and give a short response or question to Arthur. Well, this is one of those times where Arthur, you, ha you had me at hello, but then again, you had a very sympathetic audience given the fact that I am the, the progeny of two uh, African um, uh, international students who met and fell in love at Howard University in Washington, DC. Um, and so, uh, you know, there was a, a, a deep interest um, on my part, and I don't think that I've ever seen a film that has looked that intimately, that closely at the experience of the uh, the international, um, not just the international student, but just what that represents from an from an African um, uh, vantage point. And so, I was very very interested in the film. I think for me, um, at, at, what was striking was the fact that you were also telling the story on both sides of the pond. And so the question I was left with um, was how much time are you really giving to um, the backstory and to following your characters uh, you know, um, in Africa? Because to me, uh, in some ways, I think uh, some of that material struck me as, as, as the most powerful. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be a part of this pitch. Um, thank you for your response and your question. Um, 
I, I, I'm, I have a rough cut right now, and it's exactly the, the question I've been uh, wrestling with. Um, I think some of the, the footage that we captured in the home countries is um, visually interesting, but also really enables us to get at who, what makes them tick. Um, and so I would say ultimately it becomes 50-50 um, in the film. And um, the way we use it really is, even though we don't go into the national context that sometimes drives um, some of them, for example, one of the characters, the Zimbabwean um, uh, young man, you know, dreams of becoming a president some, some day of his country, um, we really follow very closely the subjective experiences of the students. Um, and so ultimately I try to tie it down to how do the questions and the concerns um, that they have and what's happening in their countries and what's happening in the U.S., how does it affect them and their families? Um, and so it's very rooted in the, in the personal. And Janet, I know that you were taken by this film too. Could you give your response and a question? Sure. I mean, I first, uh, you know, just want to add to what Marie said. I found this story to be remarkably fresh and just very diverse and unique. I haven't seen anything like this before. Um, so congratulations on that. Uh, I was very curious, you know, you, you talk about your personal journey 20 years ago, arriving here and attending MIT that led you to want to tell the story. And in terms of the, the arc and the length of time that you're following your subjects, uh, because part of the conflict is after they've, they've gained this knowledge and experience while attending MIT, the conflict of going back to their home countries. Do all of them return and are you following them through the course of that experience? Or is it just sort of this time capsule of while they're at MIT? I, wasn't, I, I didn't get a full sense of, of the full time period from when you begin to when you end filming. Thank you very much for that question. When I started the project, I envisioned it as ending when they graduate. Um, so I, I originally thought it was a four year project. But while making that film, I made um, a little bit of a spin-off little project just to improve as a filmmaker. And I learned through that that sometimes the aftermath of the experience provides an even richer and deeper context to um, the story that unfolded. And so through the accident of, you know, continuing to fundraise as an indie, indie filmmaker, um, I continued to shoot post-graduation. And in, in fact, that did happen that, you know, the, the, the tangents or the directions in which their lives took provides um, interesting insights or context for the questions they were wrestling with as undergrads at MIT. And so that becomes uh, an important part of the story and there is an aftermath section. So I did continue filming. Uh, the students graduated in 2015 and I did continue filming into 2018, 2019. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that will be part of the film as well. Um, and Terrific. I believe your question was, do they go back? Um, three of them are working in the US. They continued. Um, for advanced degrees and then one of them is um, involved in um, research on the ground in Rwanda for uh, his PhD in the London School of Economics. So none of them are full time on the continent but they do um, continue ties with their countries and in some ways figure out that the answer to the, to the questions might be kind of straddling both continents and continuing to participate in both in a way. Who else would like to ask a question of our judges? I, I would. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I'd love to echo uh, Marie and Janet's uh, praise of this project. I was uh, deeply, deeply um, drawn in and intrigued with the, uh, the sample that we saw and I, I very much look forward to seeing the finished piece. I was curious, um, we're certainly looking at uh, the parallels that your four subjects share, but you also were careful to represent four different countries uh, from the African continent. And I'm curious about how and if you're able to tease out the, um, the uniqueness of each of their experiences coming from um, those different places. Because, you know, of course, Africa can be uh, a lot of times presented as a monolith. I know you wouldn't do that, but I'm curious to hear how, um, you know, you tease that out in, in the presentation of their experiences. 
Um, I think what happened in the casting uh, provides an opportunity to kind of tease out some of those differences. Not that each, each, each of these stories does not necessarily represent the whole of, um, of their country, but within their stories, there's enough of diversity of socioeconomic backgrounds that we get to see um, you know, that diversity within the continent itself. Um, when yeah. I saw that G wagon roll up, uh, I was like, uh, this is a, yeah, this is a very different uh, lens than, than, than you would normally. Um, <laughs> it was remarkable. That's fantastic. Thank you. thank you. Well, thank you so much, Arthur. We wish you great luck on the project. Thank you so much. It was, it was a pleasure. Now let's look at our second project, All We've Lost. A young woman is brutally murdered in your town. Three years later, no one has been arrested for it. Is the killer roaming the streets? Until one morning, you wake up to a phone call telling you that your son had just confessed to the crime. All you can do is sit there and ask why, how? Of all the evidence collected at the crime scene, the hair, the bloody palm print, the footprints, the fingerprints, none of it matched him. So how could he confess? Now he's been convicted 100 years without parole and will serve the rest of his life in prison. What do you do? What can you do? That is where our main character, Bobby Clincher, found herself in 1984. 30 years later, at the age of 75, she's still fighting to bring her son home. My name is Preston Randolph, and I'm the director of All We've Lost. When he first was convicted, I vowed that I would work to get him out because I know that he was innocent. And that was in 1984. Kim Knees was viciously assaulted in the cabin of her pickup. Three years later, Barry gives them a confession. He claims that police in Louisiana coerced him to confess to that murder. Beach was sentenced to 100 years in prison with no chance of parole. Does what the person who's confessing to a crime, does it match up with the facts of the crime scene itself? You had fingerprints, palm prints, and blood. Footprints all over the place leading from the truck, and not one matched Barry. I've read thousands of pages about this case, and there were moments where I had that sort of like, what is going on here? Inmate Barry Beach, an unrepentant, convicted killer. Mr. Beach actually confessed. Had the defendant not confessed, this crime never would have been solved. There is not one moment of doubt that Barry Beach is guilty in his charge. They have an awful hard time to admit that they may have been wrong. When you believe your son is innocent through all of these decades that pass, Bobby has always been there. I made a vow to Barry that as long as I had life or until he was out, that I was going to be there for him. And, and a promise is a promise. Friends and family gathered to show their support for Barry Beach and what they call a freedom walk. Barry, Barry Beach! We're trying to be very optimistic about this. The Montana Board of Pardons and Parole rejects Barry Beach's latest attempt to get out of prison. You people are either ignorant or you're evil. I don't know what, but God help you. Yeah. But we just have to keep on and keep on fighting. We run for office because we do believe we can make a difference. Is there some way that this could be addressed legislatively? House Bill 43. House Bill 43. House Bill 43. State lawmakers are expected to take up the issue of limiting the powers of the Board of Pardons and Parole in the upcoming session. I, I, I can just feel it in my gut, Mom, that something about this could be huge. We can't wait to finally be able to have that hug from him on the outside again. Those in society who step up to defend justice are the creators of hope. I first met Bobby at a rally in Billings, Montana. Through extreme leg pain, she battled for her son, walking over a mile on a walker with a free Berry Beach sign taped to it. 
This image of her tireless dedication is what drew me to this story. After doing significant research on the case and the importance of the reform taking place, I found an inspiring, intriguing angle that convinced me that this would be a critical film as part of a wider movement toward criminal justice reform. As a filmmaker, I wanna be able to expose important social issues through my films, but through character-driven storytelling that speaks universally. It's important to show average people doing remarkable things, and our main character does that. She is a widowed, elderly, under-resourced woman who against all odds generates significant change, which eventually brings her son home from prison. We have shot 400 hours of material between 2014 and 2020. We are close to completion of a rough cut. Our composer has already developed musical themes pertaining to the story, and we'll be conducting scene spotting sessions as the assembly merges to the first cut. The film is independently produced by my company, Cactus Pro Films. Therefore, we have full creative control. The film won Best Pitch at the Big Sky Documentary Film Festival in 2018. The film is fiscally sponsored by the International Documentary Association and receives support from the Catapult Film Fund. The film features artistic elements that immerse the audience in the environment of our characters with the goal of building tension, revealing emotion, and bringing our audience as emotionally and viscerally close to the unfolding events as possible. I intend for all we've lost to generate significant conversations surrounding criminal justice reform, wrongful imprisonments, and how they transpire. Wrongful imprisonments and criminal justice reform have been a passion of mine for well over a decade. I've been involved in the Leonard Peltier case since 2008, which led me to working with the Innocence Project, Amnesty International, and many organizations that advocate for justice. I've lectured on the subject over 50 times and written articles on wrongful imprisonment that have been published on Truthout, as well as in the Huffington Post. It also led me to working with individuals like Tom Morello, Danny Glover, Harry Belafonte, and the late Pete Seeger. All inspired me to continue pursuing my craft as a filmmaker to create change and build awareness through my films. My involvement in the subject, experience in criminal justice movements, and connections to the film's key players has given me a unique opportunity to tell these stories in ways no other filmmaker has access to. Being able to document these events behind a camera has changed my life. I am certain when a wide audience views this film, they will be inspired just like I have been. Your support is key in helping me finish this film. Most of the film's budget has been raised through grassroots donations. That support has given my team and I the ability to intensely follow the story and complete production. Currently, I am raising the final post-production budget, which is $50,000. At this moment, I've raised 25,000 of that. Your support of $5,000 will go directly to the fine cut of the film. It will allow us to work with our finishing editor and expedite the process from a rough cut to a fine cut. I wanna thank you so much for this opportunity. I hope you choose to join us as we bring this inspiring story to completion. Thank you. Now let's meet the filmmaker of All We've Lost, Preston Randolph. Preston, welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, let's start with our judges. Diana, I know that you have a reaction to All We've Lost. Could you talk yeah. about that in a question to Preston? Yes, Preston, it's, um, it's, quite a, it's quite a piece and you seem to have quite a background to be the person to tell this story. How many years have you been working on it? And I'm curious also about how much with the, the main protagonist did you film in prison and outside and what kind of insights do you think that you got from, from him over that period of time and did they change? Um, well, I, I learned about the story back in 2013. And so I started reaching out to see what access I would have. Um, we really started shooting in 2014 and we've been shooting really ever, ever since. Um, uh, as, as far as story, you know, when I started, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. He was sent back to prison. Um, and then he was denied his clemency through the board of pardons and parole in Montana. And, you know, it looked like kind of a dead end after that. Um, but little did I know that there were legislators in the process of drafting new laws, which would give the governor clemency power. 
And through that process, um, you know, uh, I was able to, to gain a lot of insight on the process, um, all the great work from Innocence Projects across the country, um, and uh, just being introduced to many characters in this story that reveal a very interesting perspective, both on wrongful imprisonments and, and this particular case. Um, we had great access to our characters. Um, Is it exclusive main char- access? Exclusive as- access? Yeah, as um, a documentary film team. Have other people have access, or do you have exclusivity with the characters? Um, our main character is Bobby Clencher, which is Barry's mom, and we have exclusive access with Bobby. Now, this case was very, uh, in the state of Montana, it was covered by news, so individuals were interviewed. Um, as far as Barry Beach inside prison, we were able to follow him multiple days throughout the years, um, from working out in the gym to, you know, giving us a tour of the prison to in his cell. Um, one of my favorite scenes in our current cut is, uh, he, he feeds birds outside of his, his cell window. And, um, one thing that was really important to Barry is returning everyone who would write him letters, he would write them back. And so we follow him in his cell in that process. But, you know, for me, um, I I find the arc of this story to be extremely powerful because when I, when I started, I had no idea that new laws were going to be drafted and that process would play a part in him actually receiving clemency and getting out. Um, After he did get out, we followed our characters years after to see the adjustment to the real world outside of prison. My only, my last question, I have one more, is about, um, do you have enough material, do you think, not filler, but great material to make it with cliffhangers and to be a two-parter? Or have you thought about that? Or are you, are you just throwing a lot out to make it a feature doc? Or is it best suited, you think, as a feature doc? I believe it's best suited as a feature doc. Um, I shot over 400 hours uh, during these, these many years. Um, I think the story arc is it fits really well into a feature doc. And so that's as a filmmaker, that's really what I've been focusing on. And you and you focus on the legislators because you see a lot of times with the footage at the back of their heads walking to the to the courthouses or so. But do you actually do we learn what the what the situation is and why somebody has is is um, compelled to plead guilty but actually isn't guilty? And Absolutely. Do you follow the murder, uh, the, like who might have murdered? Yes. Um, now, this isn't an investigative documentary. Of course, we tell the backstory. Um, we uh, detail the crime, the forensics around that. But our main focus is really the human element in the case. And so our main character is his mother um, and the great change that she was able to uh, generate. However, we, care, we follow a, a number of characters really all over the country. We shot in seven different cities, both coasts and then in Montana. Um, But yes, we follow the legislators, why they feel this is important. And, you know, during this time, I think it's, it's extremely important to also feature stories of Democrats and Republicans coming together over an issue and being like, this is wrong. We need to fix it. And uh, so we have numerous characters that we talk to and experts within wrongful imprisonments. Um, but the heart of the story really is with Barry Beach's mother as she stood by her son for over 35 years and um, was able to generate historic change because of her efforts. Um, Christine, do you have a question? Yeah, um, you know, I agree that it's a really powerful story. And I think the fact that it's driven, you know, by Barry's mother really lends it that intimacy that we might not have if we were just seeing legislators passing laws, you know, in a courthouse. Um, I'm curious, you know, it seems that the laws uh, about clemency and and everything that goes into wrongful convictions being overturned are sort of all over the place in terms of state by state differences. Have you thought about your goals for this project beyond the traditional, you know, getting a distributor, um, having a theatrical run? Do you have an idea of what you want to do in terms of impact, maybe in terms of legislation, getting this seen by lawmakers. Um, I'm just curious what your take on that is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's a very important part of this film. Um, and just with my background and passion for wrongful imprisonments, I want this to generate change. 
I want this to um, generate more conversations on this issue. And it is an issue that, that is different state by state. In the, in the state of Montana, the governor did not have clemency power. And that all rested with the Board of Pardons and Parole. And there wasn't a check and balance on that board. And um, this case inspired legislators to come together and change that. And there's a lot of states that I, I feel can be inspired by what happened in Montana. And I think what's really important for me as a filmmaker is telling, and telling stories from individuals that, you know, if you, if you were to look at them, you would think that they could generate such change. And um, there's a lot of people in our criminal justice system that are dealing with similar issues that Bobby Clincher has dealt with. And I think they can watch this and, you know, there, there will be a sense of hope. They can get inspired and motivated because here, here's a woman who is a, a single mom for a lot of her life who didn't have a lot of resources. And against all odds, she fought for over three decades and inspired this new change that led to her son getting out of prison. And that law has led to other individuals getting out of prison in Montana. But the story is nationwide. We, we follow Innocence Projects and organizations like Centurion Ministries um, in New Jersey, we're in Seattle, we're in the Midwest, we're, I mean, we're all over the place because this is this is an issue that is nationwide. I mean, it's globally. We wish you great luck with your project. Now it's time to meet our third uh, candidate and the film is called Traces of Home. My name is Colette Gunim and I am a documentary filmmaker based in Chicago. Traces of Home shares a personal story that intertwines family, migration, and intergenerational trauma within a global expedition. My parents, Issa and Husni, met and fell in love in Chicago. Escaping their home countries as children, they both took refuge in the United States. Issa running away from an abusive father in Mexico and Husni fleeing violence in Palestine were forced out of their childhood homes and never returned. Growing up in the suburbs of Illinois, my parents provided me and my brother with a very stable, all-American upbringing. My father, a wedding videographer, filmed over 100 hours of us growing up, from birthday parties to dance recitals to full diaper changes, unfortunately. From the outside, it appeared as if we were living the American dream. However, I was completely disconnected from my roots, and I had no idea why. It wasn't until I studied abroad in college that I began yearning to explore my own ancestral homelands. I started Traces of Home back in 2017 when the current U.S. administration began vilifying both Arabs and Latinos through discriminatory policies. Knowing that my parents came from both communities, I felt compelled to share their stories of forced migrations. I then worked to convince them to come along to locate their childhood homes in Mexico and Palestine for the first time. The two trips are transformative for my entire family. My father, upon entering his hometown, breaks down weeping and complete disbelief that he's actually there. My mother sees herself and the children who are stuck at the border in Tijuana without their parents, just like she was decades ago. As for myself, the richness of the landscapes and the warmth of the people produce a strange sense of loss within me, and I'm forced to confront my deeper, more personal reasons for wanting to return. Like many children of immigrants, I was raised in a very strict, formal household where I faced constant criticism for being too loud or emotional. It felt like being my full self was a bad thing, and only through our travels did I realize that my parents' desire for perfection was rooted in their past traumas. While Traces of Home touches on major social issues such as border militarization, domestic violence, and the Israeli occupation, the heart of the film lies in my internal quest to heal the disconnect I've always felt from my parents. Seeing them come alive in their home countries with their communities makes me feel closer to them than I had ever felt in our pristine suburban home in the U.S. What starts out as an adventure film to find the homes becomes a reflection on love, family, and reconciliation. Traces of Home is currently in post-production with four-time Oscar-nominated production collective Cartemquin Films. We aim to premiere the film in January 2022 at a top tier film festival. We've raised a third of the budget thus far and are in conversations with Hulu, POV, Al Jazeera, and others. A grant of $5,000 
would allow us to work with Emmy-nominated editor Sarah Mamouri for four weeks to reach a rough cut stage. This film is an American story. The future of the United States will be majority Latino uh, and multiracial by 2050. Without acknowledging the impact of being severed from our roots by choice or by force, how can children of immigrants and refugees feel a strong sense of self in the United States? This film serves as a catalyst for those who never really felt home to heal themselves and their families. Thank you. Growing up here in the suburbs, everything's supposed to be so beautiful and peaceful. Why did I feel so much tension inside of me? I knew that I was Mexican and Palestinian, but my parents raised me to be this perfect American. The thing is, we're not perfect Americans. Yeah, no, no, es que te ves muy como right, viejito, right. Que te, viejito que estás sentado. Va a faltar más. We both came to the United States not because we came here for a better life, but because we were running away from something. I was born in Palestine in 1944. The Zionists came from everywhere in the world. They destroy homes, they kill people. We left Safad. It was like 12 hours walking, okay, and we never came back. I was born in Mexico City. My father, he was an alcoholic. He would beat our mother. My mother woke us up about five in the morning and she said to us, if your dad wakes up, tell him that you're going to school. We are moving to the United States. I have never been back to where we lived before. I wanted to return with my parents to find my cultural roots. I didn't realize I'd have to actually face how their trauma affected me. Did you feel home at home growing up? Oh. <laughs> oh, man. I felt like something was missing. How would you feel about going back now to find your home? I have no idea. I don't so. think so. I can't handle it. Don't forget your promise to your mom. <laughs> no more crying. <laughs> there was like a part of me that would just became very angry and sad. They were hiding the pain, but even with them trying to hide it, you feel it. My greatest disappointment, I feel that I failed you. You don't know how much it hurt me when you would say that you hated me. They didn't have much of a childhood. You've just seen Traces of Home. Let's meet the filmmaker, Colette Gunim. Colette, welcome. Who would like to ask the first question? Uh, Janet? Yes. We're all dying to. <laughs> um, hi, lovely to meet you. Um, my question, uh, this is such a beautiful, beautiful story. And I was deeply moved by both of your parents' journeys in returning to their, their home country. I'm curious um, how much of the story is your story and your sibling's story and how much of this is your parents' story or are they intertwined? Thank you so much. And thank you for having me as part of this pitch. Um, so the biggest thing that I realized in the journey of making this film was that in the beginning, I was planning for it to be about my parents and to be about their story of going back home. 
But along the journey, starting to realize that I am the one making my parents go on these journeys and why am I making my parents do this for me? So it has shifted to make me actually the thread of the film and like my voice becoming the through line that that viewers are connecting to my parents stories through myself and also having my brother as sort of my mirror of having this person that I that went through the very similar experience and talking about our our relationships at home with our parents as well so it's definitely becoming I'm starting to like own that it is my story and that my parents um, are doing this because they want to do it for their daughter and me being the inciting factor for them to do this uh, journey as well. And, and I'm just one more question, sorry. Um, and in terms of the narrative arc, you know, you follow them, they return to their home, homeland. It's very beautiful and emotional. Where do you take the story from there? What, what's, what comes afterwards? So the story of us like going on these journeys back is directly going to be intertwined with my internal quest of trying to find home and why I didn't feel like I could be comfortable in my own house growing up. And in terms of like the trajectory of the film, we're going on these journeys of uh, discovering these new places, but also I'm going internal of trying to understand myself and my family and into the climaxes of finding the homes and trying to find the homes. I'm also having this revelation with my mom confronting her about our, our relationship and how her trauma affected us and me and my upbringing. So this, this internal quest is also being intertwined with the journeys. Um, and then of course, having this resolution of not necessarily being completely healed and like, oh, now we're a happy family, but even just being able to incite that, that reconciliation between our family and letting this be a sort of inspiration for healing for others is a big goal of mine. Beautiful. Great. Thank well, you. I, I just wanna say that, um, that when I see films like this, it just reminds me why it's so incredibly important to, that we're doing everything that we can just to expand the circle of, of voices and experience in documentary film. Um, you know, I've seen many, many films um, that are about the, the return. But to me, what um, I thought was incredibly powerful was this idea of what happens in terms of um, that inter intergenerational trauma and what happens in families when, um, you know, that point of no return is one that is as, um, as challenging as clearly it was the case for both of your parents. And you know that scene that you capture when you talk to your dad about going back and you see that intense level of distress in him is so, 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 so powerful. Um, I think for me, the thing that I'm interested in is, is understanding a little bit more about what you, and I assume that's your brother, I yes. Assume that's your yes. Brother. Mm -hmm. These are my daughters that you might be hearing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> they sound adorable. <laughs> <laughs> they really are. But you know, I'm very curious about um, about what you both learn about your 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 parents. You know, and and how that either. Uh, you said that this isn't about, you know, this big, uh, you know, we've solved it all, but, but where does that kind of take us in terms of, of, of trying to, to perhaps help other people who are, are also trying to find their, their own way home in a sense, people of your generation? Mm. Yeah, I mean, definitely the transformation that my parents went through and watching them, seeing them like go home was absolutely so moving for both me and my brother. I wasn't expecting specifically for my dad to like fit in so perfectly when he went to Palestine. Like that was, that was obviously his home. He turned into like this very boisterous patriarch, which he never was in the US. And like seeing his full self, his full self, especially as me being an adult and understanding why he is the way he is, 
Uh, I just, I'm like, oh my gosh, every family needs to do this. If they've never gone back to their roots, like how can you really feel close to your family if you've never, if you don't know where they're coming from too. So that was huge for, for my whole family. And I definitely think like in terms of going forward and like having children of immigrants be sort of the backbone of the United States moving forward with like the majority becoming multiracial, us knowing where we're coming from and where our parents are coming from and why they are the way they are is essential for our own identity and sense of self and self-love for, um, for ourselves too. I was very moved by this, by your project as well. And I think for your generation and also for generations before and after you, it's so important. Most families, I, it feels like do they keep these generational and in, and their own, uh, traumas and their secrets and the way that you were able to tease that out and to learn from it and from your brother, the little that we see of him also seems quite, quite interesting. So the deeper you can go, I think it will help people to determine that. I imagine you don't speak to any experts in it, but that could be part of the impact campaign because so many people don't want to talk about these things. It's too painful and that you, that you capture your parents and their pain and their opening. And it's really remarkable. Much, that means a lot, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Colette. Uh, good luck on your project. Thank you. Now it's time to look at our next project and it's My Existence is Resistance. Hello judges, my name is Rafael Samanez and I'm the director of My Existence is Resistance. I'm excited to tell you about this film and why I think it's important that this film be made. First and foremost, My Existence is Resistance is a feature length documentary that follows the lives of three incredible trans women of color in New York City um, whose work is breaking barriers within their communities. Sadly, 2020 was the deadliest year for the trans community with 39 murders reported across the United States. This is an epidemic. Four in five Trans women killed our women of color, and 66% of them are black transgender women. As I tr started transitioning from my work as a director of um, a nonprofit to a director of film, I wanted to focus my work on issues of social justice um, and the most pressing issues of social justice, which to me were transgender issues. Um, the idea for my existence of resistance came about when I met Cayenne Dorshow when I was filming for my short film Out of the Shadows, which followed the first transgender um, salon cooperative in the United States that started in Queens. Um, I met Cayenne and I thought the, her story needed to be told. Uh, she was such an incredible person. Um, and we talked and she was agreed with the idea and um, we decided to start this film. We follow three amazing transgender women, as I said before. The first is Elisa Crespo, who is the first Puerto Rican trans woman to run for city council. Uh, she runs for, she's running for District 15th in the Bronx. Um, this is a historic um, run, um, being the first transgender woman. And um, the next person is Liam Winslet, who um, has to fill the shoes of Lorena Borjas. Lorena Borjas is an iconic Latin X transgender woman in Queens, known for her work around HIV prevention and uh, the decriminalization of sex work. The person that ties everything together is uh, Cayenne Dorshow, um, a black transgender woman who for more than 30 years has um, helped girls get, uh, get out of prison by um, paying their bond and providing a safe place for them to stay once they get out of prison. Um, <clears throat> she has done this by sometimes even using her own money uh, to, to, to pay for the Airbnbs or the hotel so they can stay uh, once they get out on, on, on bond. Um, as Black Lives Matter protests increased this summer after the killing, killing of George Floyd and others, uh, she was catapulted into center stage. And uh, especially as Black Lives Matter was, um, was, became central. 
and her work was finally recognized and supported, allowing her to fundraise millions of dollars uh, where she was able to purchase property to house transgender people. We were there when this happened and we filmed it. Um, it was a, an incredible experience and we have been there along her journey. In this, um, in this next four minute video um, we're about to show you, uh, you will see this historic moment in a montage that we, we, we put together for you. I would like to thank you uh, for your time and if our project is selected, um, your funds will be used to um, contribute to the completion of our film and to elevate the voices and visibility of trans women of color. Thank you. I'm wondering if, if it's possible to determine a uh, isolation site at this time, if she's released on Monday. If she's released on Monday, we can put her in an Airbnb. Perfect. Um, and I talked to her about, you know, our conversation. She said she had a job. She won't have a job now. I was like, Let's see, just trying to keep everyone safe right now. This is a health pandemic. Yeah. And she understood. Okay. So, can I yeah, can I literally call you back? Because today is like International Awards Day. But COVID is such a unique thing because we've never had it. We've never had a pandemic ever. We've never seen that. What does it mean for a community that's taking care of themselves? We have always taken care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are independent hosts, mm -hmm. which means we don't have to depend on a government. We have taken care of each other in a way that makes sense. motherfucking trans people. I love you. I am the founder of Glitz Inc. That's gays and lesbians living in a transgender society. I named it that because we have always been last. That's not gonna happen anymore. We're first. On Sunday, my white allies and my black allies that they were gonna raise money for me. In New York City, I want y'all to know, we damn near sitting on a million dollars. Baby. Uh, we're buying equity. We're buying property. This is what black power looks like. <laughs> this is what trans lives look like. Now let's meet the director of My Existence is Resistance, Raphael Samenez. Raphael, welcome. Christine, would you like to give your comments to Raphael and his film? Sure. Well, first of all, I, I really like this project. I love it. it. It 
was so powerful. I think the clip you included, um, even though we really are focusing on only one of your characters, Cayenne, she, she's amazing um, on camera. And so I see why you chose that. I would have loved to see, you know, your other characters a bit too and, and know a little bit more about, you know, who they are and, and see them on screen. Um, so my one of my questions for you is, um, first of all, with Cayenne's story being so powerful, how do you balance that with the other two? And do their paths overlap um, in the course of the film? Or is this really three distinct worlds that we're going to be in? Thank you, Christine, for the question. And thank you for inviting me to this pitch. Um, hello, judges. Um, and um, the other uh, two women that we're following are extremely powerful as well. Um, so I think that balances itself. We have Elisa Crespo, who is the first um, transgender Puerto Rican woman running for district um, city council here, District 15. Um, <clears throat> an incredible character as well. Um, and Liam Winslet, who has to take over um, um, Lorena Borjas, who, who died of COVID-19. Um, in March, um, and she has to literally pick up the organization uh, with the help of volunteers and um, make sure that uh, the uh, people, the, the transgender women and men, um, a lot of them who are sex workers and practice survival sex work you know, um, and have no access to social safety nets such as unemployment and other things are taken care of, you know, and we will see, you see um, um, just uh, uh, just getting food to them is, is, is important. Um, but Cayenne, as an elder <clears throat> Black trans woman, really, really ties everything together, um, bringing the community together. Um, she, the, the, how I met Cayenne was actually filming at a, at a sex workers march held by Liam in Queens. So they're always working, cross-working together. And Cayenne has actually supported Elisa's campaign um, as the first transgender woman. So there's all this interlap going on. Um, and it was a beautiful scene when I actually filmed the first meeting for the first time, Elisa and Cayenne at that march that you saw at the Brooklyn uh, protest you saw on the, on the clip. Um, that's where they met and we captured that moment. That's great. Yeah, I love that. Um, and obviously, you know, you mentioned COVID. Um, I'm curious how that sort of affected your filming because you you really have been in, in real time during the pandemic um, and how you've adapted to that. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's been pretty difficult um, and um, scary at the same time, um, but, we, uh, during the filming of um, Cayenne's and um, we're now filming Elisa Crespo and Liam, um, but during Cayenne's we're pretty much just filming her and coming back home, her and coming back home. So we really isolated ourselves um, to, to, to um, that uh, kind of like a pod um, that we had made. Um, and always of course we're in PPEs and things like that. So, but you know, when you're in these marches and things like that, it's, it's um, you know, the risk of contracting COVID it's pretty, pretty large. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, I'm curious, it's, it's so many huge issues that you're dealing with here that these women are involved in. So I'll be really curious to see how you balance that. And I wanna give other people a chance to, to ask you some questions as well, but um, I'm excited for this project. Thank you. Thank you. Opal, do you have any comments? Yeah, Raphael, I first want to say thank you so much for uh, providing this focus. It's so very needed. Um, this is a community that we just keep hearing about all the tragedy, and I don't really feel like I've seen sufficient attention paid to really make inroads um, to bridge the gap between larger understandings of um, you know, trans experience, trans journeys, trans humanity. Uh, so I am really, really grateful for the work that you're doing in this project, even as it's not completed yet. <laughs> it's so important and, uh, and I salute you for that. Um, I am curious, you said that the, that the uh, film is still in production. Um, is, are there a, a natural sort of set of arcs that are, that are um, presenting themselves right now? Because um, 
given the circumstances that we're that we're all facing, I imagine it's difficult to sort of be able to to follow um, characters as you normally would be uh, able to, and and have that sort of access to, you know, get a broader um, gathering of of story. So, are there? I know Kayan, um she received the funding to to purchase a house, but I'm curious for your other characters, are there sort of natural arcs or circumstances that they're in um, that you're following to to their conclusion? Yes, uh, thank you, um, Opal, for, for that. Um, the, the arc with Elisa Crespo, uh, for Cayenne, it's, you know, um, we, we, she received the money and um, just to update, you know, she was able to buy the building, you know, and, and we were there and it, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, for Elisa Crespo, um, the arc is going to be her campaign, you know, her campaign and um, uh, personally, we're already starting to see her come into power, you know, as a trans woman. Um, <clears throat> and, and I think that's going to be um, uh, developing of that arc, you know, as, as coming in kind of wary of, you know, how the community is going to react to, to then uh, I think the post just released a, a, an article on her um, um, and having been arrested in, in, in Florida for, for, for sex work back years ago. Um, so now she's having to face that, you know, and, 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 and how she's going to face that determines her campaign, you know, so these are the arcs that we're seeing develop, at least with Elisa's case. With Liam's, it's, it's a little bit more difficult, but, um, um, it's really about, just her, her courage and tenacity to just keep, you know, the work of Lorena Borjas um, and um, especially around the courts, um, uh, making sure the trans girls are, are um, finishing their programs and getting their felonies and uh, you know, discharged and all these things. How is she able to continue to do that um, with, with all the limitations? So. Um, it's more of a, uh, it becomes more of an intra, a personal um, arc uh, for, for, for Liam rather than a campaign or uh, material support that Cayenne is building. So these are the three arcs that we're seeing developed in the film. And you mentioned, uh, Lorena, are we getting an introduction to, to her at all since she's sort of uh, uh, an inspiration? You mentioned that, uh, that Liam is taking over um, her role. So is there an introduction there and as you're there will be there will be um um i don't think that transgredient though the organization that she's part of um we, we cannot talk about it without speaking about who lorena borjas is so we have to speak who she is and what she did and what happened and 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 and, and liam does that very well um in her interviews and through her work so um so yes we will <laughs> Raphael, thank you so much. Great luck with your project. Now it's time to take a look at our final project, Olive and Jack. Hi, I'm Michelle Govea, and I'm the director of Olive and Jack, the love story that changed Hollywood. Olive Thomas and Jack Pickford were two popular movie stars during the silent movie era. One of the most popular couples in Hollywood, their relationship was portrayed by the press as a fairy tale romance. Yet, in reality, their marriage had more drama than any of their movies. Their volatile relationship came to a sudden and tragic end in 1920, when Olive died under mysterious circumstances. Her death shocked moviegoers around the globe, and the subsequent scandal would have lasting effects in the industry for decades to come. I've loved silent movies since I was a little girl. I remember one day reading Mary Pickford's autobiography, and in it was a photo of Olive Thomas. That haunting image stayed with me for years. And later, as an adult, I decided to investigate and find out more about her life. As I dug deeper, I found there were more questions than answers. Now, 20 years later, I'm ready to tell her story in this documentary. The events surrounding Olive and Jack occurred 100 years ago. As such, there are no living witnesses. So we'll be relying on historians, film critics, relatives, and noted members of the film community today to help us tell their story. 
We will also be utilizing original B-roll as well as a ton of archival images and footage, including clips from some of Olive and Jack's films that haven't been seen in nearly a century. We are currently in production on the film. Even though the pandemic has closed archives and we've had to reschedule the bulk of our interviews, we've still managed to dig up some new material for the film and conduct some great interviews here in New York. Filmmaking isn't a solo project, which is why I've put together a strong team to help tell this story. That team includes famed indie filmmaker Allison Anders as executive producer. With Allison's strong connections in the industry, we're able to land some of our biggest interviews. In addition, we have a Tony-nominated composer who's creating an original score for the film and a cinematographer whose documentary work has screened at some of the country's leading film festivals. We had a successful Kickstarter campaign in March which raised $30,000, but that won't pay for everything. Winning this grant will help us pay to digitize the archival material that is so crucial to telling this story. I'd like to thank the Paley Center and a and &E for supporting first-time directors with this grant. Now, I'd like to introduce you to Olive and Jack. Olive, Thomas, and Jack Pickford were Hollywood darlings. People loved them. There were no really celebrities. And then all of a sudden, we had films. It's the first time people could be fans, and people in pictures are held way up on pedestals. People really didn't know what a huge industry in cinema would become. Olive was a brilliant comedian. She's just so physically funny, comedically funny, slapstick funny. People are often very surprised when they look back and see what women were doing on screen in those eras. Jack, the audiences loved him. He had great charisma. He's very believable, the characters that he plays. They were like the perfect partnership. They looked perfect in every way. But when the fame came and when the money came, it's a recipe for disaster. Because of the circumstances, it had a huge impact. There was such an unknown to it. There was such a question mark. There was a rumor that Jack killed her, that she killed herself. Her accounts of drugs, alcohol, people were horrified by everything that was kept from them. It was the first of a number of incidents where people were killed or died. People started questioning the morals of Hollywood. As a result, a new form of censorship came into place. Married couples had to sleep in separate beds. Movies had to keep everything very puritanical. It becomes the collapse of early Hollywood. It was such a big scandal for the time that it makes me beg the question, why has this story been forgotten? Now let's meet the filmmaker of Olive and Jack, Michelle Govea. Michelle, welcome, and great looking at your project. Now, who would like to ask the first question? Marie, would you like to talk about your response to Olive and Jack? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, uh, congratulations. What what beautiful material that you you have the the good fortune of being able to work with in in trying to tell um, this un, unknown story. Uh, of how of, of not just what was happening behind the scenes in this relationship, um, but just also the impact that that would then have on Hollywood um, for some time to come. So I, I, I it was it, it never ceases to amaze me uh, how many twists and turns there are out there, but uh, but it really um, at least initially. Uh, reminded me, of course, of the story of Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. 
and so you finding this interesting caper, this interesting mystery, um, I think gives us another hook and another place to, to go in terms of peeling back the layers. And so I, I think for me, the, the, the obvious question is, um, you know, uh, how do you uh, really go about trying to, are you trying to solve the mystery uh, of what happens to Olive? Um, or is this, um, again, just uh, an opportunity to, to pose um, interesting questions um, uh, for us to understand it um, somewhat better? Well, first off, thank you um, for having me today. Um, the issue of Olive's death can never truly be solved because there were only two people in the room and they're both dead. And so unless there's, you know, a mysterious letter appears, um, all we can do is speculate. But what I am trying to do is correct a lot of misinformation that has built up in a hundred years since this happened. Um, it's really interesting how rumors a few years later pop up in books as facts. And so one of the things I'm doing is going through different uh, things in their lives and trying to clarify what's true, what isn't true. And in some cases, it makes some of the traditional stories that have been told about them a little less interesting. But as a documentary filmmaker, one of my jobs, I believe, is to tell the truth and to find the truth in the story. And so that's what I'm trying to do. And Janet, do you have a question? Sure, you know, again, um, it feels like this is more conceptual and early stage and I love archival rich, rich stories. Um, so I was very intrigued uh, by the idea of telling the Olive and Jack story. I'm curious, you know, in terms of timing, um, you talk about how their, their story has, has impacted film and censorship. Um, so why do you feel like the story is important to tell now? I think particular? that there are um, topics, there's subjects in, in, in the course of telling their story that will, be in the film that are still being discussed today. For example, the early days of filmmaking really saw the birth of celebrity culture, which is still something that we deal with today. Another thing is the role of women in Hollywood. Uh, when Olive came to the movie industry in 1916, women actually had much bigger roles in the industry than they do today. And so it's interesting to see the changes that happened. Um, and also the issue of censorship, that there were religious and conservative groups in 1920 and into the 20s uh, who were trying to uh, censor films, get them stopped. And that's something that we're still dealing with today. So although the story is 100 years old, there are things about it that people will recognize and are still being discussed today. Mm -hmm. And, and how do you intend to kind of thread that needle uh, through interviews or just through like, other archival? We, we will be doing um, interviews with people who have expertise in certain fields. Um, we've already interviewed some people who um, have done a lot of work on early women pioneers in Hollywood. Um, we are waiting for a vaccine <laughs> so that we can hit the road and get more of our interviews done. Um, but we've already done some really good, strong interviews and um, we will be using interviews with people along with archival material. Um, we're also going to get films that haven't been seen in probably a hundred years digitized and have excerpts from those in the film as well so that people can see Olive and Jack in action. Are you planning to have a narrator and possibly ask an, an American actress to, to uh, read the narration or what, do you have any thoughts about that? We are toying with the idea of having a narrator. It would be a woman. Um, we also are discussing having um, 
age-appropriate actors read uh, Jack and Olive's words from some of their interviews. Uh, one of the interesting things about telling the story about Olive and Jack is that because they were in silent movies, we've never heard their voices. And so I think it would be interesting to give voice to their words um, in the only way that we can. And are you going to be using fair use for this or are you, do you have a budget for clearances? Well, we do have a budget for clearances. Uh, the good thing about Olive is that her stuff is in the public domain, okay. but a lot of these films are in archives and um, need to be digitized in order to show them. And so that's a big cost that exists. Right. Do you have any descendants um, of, of either of them that are, is the family, any family members or distant relatives in, involved? There, there are. Um, all of Ann Jack never had children, but there's uh, nieces and nephews and descendants of them who we will be interviewing. Right. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I would like to thank all our five filmmakers. I can't wait to see these five films. They all of a fantastic interest. Also want to thank our judges that have given such cogent points and I'm sure it's helpful to any filmmaker watching. So I'd like to thank you for joining us for this Paley at Home, sponsored by City. Please vote for your favorite film, and we will be announcing our grand prize winner and Audience Choice Award on December 16th. The grand prize winner will receive a grant from a and &E Indie Films. Be sure to support the Paley Center and consider becoming a member and visiting paleycenter.org. Take care. <laughs>